Sometimes in life, all it takes is one connection to set things in motion. For Jeff Pivar, it was a connection to Ricky Lee Jones by his good friend Michael Ruff that was a turning point in his career as a musician. Jeff toured extensively with Ricky, but this exposure helped open the doors to other connections. Since that time, Jeff has gone on to perform and record with an amazing array of artists, such as Ray Charles, Crosby, Stills & Nash, James Taylor, Mark Cohn, Kenny Loggins, Carly Simon, Phil Collins, and Dr. John, to name a few. Fast forward through his busy career, and you might find it surprising that this incredibly talented multi-instrumentalist never released a solo album until now. The recently released debut album, From the Core, is a unique project that was originally not intended to be a solo release, rather music to support a PBS documentary called The Marble Halls of Oregon. Jeff recorded his tracks inside the Oregon Caves National Monument, and when the National Park Service heard his compositions, they encouraged Jeff to release it as a solo album. Inside Music Cast is pleased to welcome Jeff Pivar. Hey Jeff, thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Hey, I want to go back, uh, let's go back to 1983, uh, when your good friend and past Inside Music Cast guest, um, Michael Ruff, brought, uh, brought you in for an audition with uh, Ricky Lee Jones. So you, you got the gig and you toured with Ricky and Michael. And uh, would you consider this a pretty major turning point in your career at that time? Oh, definitely. I, I, Mike and I go back to when I think I was 15, he was 13, and the kid was playing jazz level piano like a, a 50 year old master at that age. <laughs> I mean, I met him, just meeting him changed my life. You know, I was playing in some bar bands and we were playing, you know, Van Morrison and Jay Giles and little this, little that. And then I heard Michael and it tore the head of my, you know, the, the top of my head off because uh, <laughs> I, I didn't realize music could be. Anyone could be so proficient, and to do that at thirteen, you know, it was pretty crazy. Wow. So, I uh, he and I became very close and uh, remained, you know, to pals. And when he got this gig with Ricky, he had called me. He said, "Listen, you know, she's holding auditions. If you want to fly yourself out, come on out. I'll get you a spot." Wow. And uh, there were other musicians who were, you know, up for the gig, and I know that he had some influence to get me this spot. You know, I was a little green um, and and he was able to help me get the spot. And and interestingly, my um, my tenure with Ricky is still alive today. I started touring with her the last couple of years, uh, both in a larger band that was uh, supporting the celebration of her 30th anniversary of her first two records. And we were doing, we were touring as a large band with three or four horns. And now I'm touring with Ricky Lee Jones in a trio with a cellist named Ed Willett. So oh, I'm wow. a multi-instrumentalist in that. I'm playing guitar, mandolin, dobro, uh, organ. And uh, that's really amazing. Wow. So, so tell us, uh, with your new um, revived uh, tour with, with Ricky Lee Jones, uh, so, so what kind of material is she doing these days? What time, kind of stuff you are you know doing? What? Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. We get on stage, we have no idea what she's going to choose. <laughs> there's, there's no set list given, and she'll just start going into tunes, and whether they're tunes that we've played before or not, and, mm -hmm. and whether they're tunes that she has done in the past in a certain groove, she might be starting in an entirely different um, interpretation, which personally I love. I love flying by the seat of my pants. I did some tours with uh, David Crosby and Graham Nash where mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they, you know, we did one rehearsal and then we went out and started doing the tour and four gigs into it, they tore up the set list and they would ask people to raise hands and call out songs. Yeah. So I'm a real fan of being able to uh, play music of the moment and, 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 you know, interpret music that happens to be going on at that very moment versus certain tours where they play the records exactly note for note. You know? yeah, yeah. Well, we were going to ask that question a, a little later on about, you know, but you brought it up uh, already about, you know, with, with Crosby and Nash that uh, that when you guys toss the set lists and, of course, with, with, Ricky, with Ricky Lee, you're, uh, you're saying that, that, uh, that that's very comfortable water for you to be able to swim in improvisation, I think. Where, where did that... Uh, um, you know, where did that love or ability come along? That's a good question. You know, I've often asked myself where this stuff comes from. Yeah. Um, you know, I, as time has gone on, I have become more and more comfortable with um, 
allowing music to happen versus trying. And this is actually something that Michael Ruff said to me when I was a baby. I mean, I was, you know, a teenager. And, and Michael said, Jeff, I see you trying so hard. You know, you don't have to try so hard. You can just accept that you have the gift. And I mean, that's easy for him to say, playing the way he did at that age. <laughs> so it took me another 20 years to even get close to understand what the hell he was saying. But, but this concept that, uh, that I've you know recently kind of surrendered to that music is and the muse is something that's just around it's in the air and if you allow yourself to get to a place where you kind of surrender and and allow music to play you trying to play music there's something that can happen that's a you know a very profound and uh, unexplainable uh, phenomenon having to do with the muse, having to do with putting yourself into that consciousness of, of attempting to be the vessel rather than the purpose, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's almost like a concept of, of jazz. I mean, if you would, if you if you think about it, I mean, there's so much, there's a basic foundational structure in jazz chordings and writings, but then on top of that, it's just what you make out of it and what comes to you. So it's almost a similar type of philosophy, wouldn't you say? It is, and, and it's something that I've been drawn to, and it's something that I've participated in uh, from very early on in my career. I was playing in you know jazz and jazz rock type groups in Hartford, Street Temperature, various bands, you know, that um, improvisation was really the, the, the core of it. And uh, so, you know, having a chance to do that for decades uh, definitely produces more of a, a comfort in trusting that rather than trying to find the answers that the answers or maybe suggestions will basically make themselves available and that all you have to do is just kind of relax and, and surrender yeah. and allow that to come through. Absolutely. That's, That's neat. Hey, Jeff, uh, we were having some uh, technical difficulties with our Skype connection. So what we've done is that we've switched you back over to a phone line. So uh, let's continue on. Sure. Well, we were talking about 1983 and, and Ricky Lee Jones, but it was about a year later that another audition came your way, and that's with the uh, Ray Charles Orchestra. And you spent a few years with Ray traveling, you know, all over the world for gigs. And I think you even spent some time in the studio with Ray. I mean, tell us about this experience uh, with, with Ray. Well, it was a very interesting way this all came about. I happened to have a Friday night off, which was rare for me. I, I tended to stay pretty busy, you know, when I was a kid and, and a teenager playing gigs, you know, various with various bands. I happened to have a Friday night off, and I saw that Ray Charles was playing at the Palace Theater in New Haven, Connecticut. And I had always heard about Ray Charles, but I had never seen him perform. And you know, is this kind of bigger than life name? And I thought, man, I have to, I have to go see Ray Charles. This is going to be a a life experience. So I was planning to go, and the phone rang, and a friend of mine called me and he said, hey, a friend of ours happens to be filling in on guitar tonight. This friend of ours, Morris Pleasure, who is now a dear friend of mine, Morris was filling in on, uh, on guitar because Ray's guitar player left. He, he, my friend said to me, you should go down and see if you can get the gig. So now I had two reasons to go, and I decided to go early. And, and so what I did was um, I pulled into the... Uh, the uh, parking lot of the theater and, and waited, and sure enough, about 20 minutes after I got there, pulls up the Ray Charles band. <laughs> so um, they're filing out of the bus, and I went up to uh, one of the musicians and asked, you know, who's, the, who's the band leader? And sure enough, pointed out the band leader, and I told the, the band leader, Clifford Solomon, may he rest in peace, that I was interested in the gig. Now, it just so happened that I had uh, a copy of the recent Rolling Stone magazine, which had a review on a Ricky Lee Jones record I played on, and they said something nice about my guitar playing. So I, I kind of brought that as some leverage, you know, just <laughs> so the guy didn't think I was some crazy guy off the street. Anyway, um, they invited me to come in and watch the show, and he would talk to me after the show, just so I can get an idea of what they were doing, and uh, he would talk to me further. So I watched the show, and there I am seeing everybody reading charts. Now, I'm a self-taught musician. I learned how to play by listening to the radio and by, you know, a couple song books that had chord, guitar chord diagrams, and really, I'm, you know, I'm a self-taught musician. So reading wasn't exactly what I would call my strong point. 
In fact, I barely read it all. And there I am seeing them all reading their charts, and I'm going, oh, man, this is kind of above my head. I, I, I wouldn't be able to do this. But but I had kind of this conversation with myself, kind of like that scene in uh, in uh, in the movie um, uh, Animal House, where there's an angel and a devil on each shoulder, yeah. and the devil was saying, oh, you can't do this, you're not good enough. And the angel was saying to me, you know what, Jeff, until you, you prove to yourself you can't do it, why would you talk yourself out of it? So I kind of went past my fear with it, and when Clifford came off the stage on the first set, he said, are you interested in this? You know, did you check it out? And I said, yeah, I really want to, I, w- I would love to audition. He asked me if I had a tape, and I said, I'll be right back. So I was in New Haven, Connecticut. I jumped in my car, drove as fast as I could to a studio in Hartford, Connecticut, where I had fortunately been able to have access to for the last year or two prior to that. I I met a a dear man who was the studio owner named Doug Cupper, and Doug had started hiring me for all his session work and then was kind enough to give me the keys to his studio so I could go into the studio at night and work on my own compositions and learn how to overdub and learn how to become a better musician. So I had a bunch of snippets of different types of rhythm and blues guitar playing of mine that I dubbed off onto a cassette as quickly as possible, and I jumped in the car and drove back to the Palace Theater in New Haven, about 45 minutes away, and I must have been going 90 miles an hour, and I got there just as the band was leaving to get on on the bus uh, (laughs) from their performance. And the strength of that cassette got me a call to come do an actual audition with the uh, orchestra the next day or, wow. the, or the following day after that. That's excellent. So what? it was kind of a thing where, you know, you overcome your self-doubt, and I love the saying, you know, if you really want something in this life that you go after it and you kind of don't take no until you realize that, no, it's not supposed to happen, or if you think it is supposed to happen, then you make it happen. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we don't we don't really have many opportunities to ask questions to guys uh, like you that have actually toured and recorded with Ray, but you did, and uh, so you know, and you got to to tour with him later on in Europe. So, one question that I'd like to ask is, can you tell us what was Ray's relationship with the touring band as you covered, you know, Europe and and you know traveling with them? Uh, were you guys uh, tight with him? Did he disappear <laughs> after shows? What was the relationship there? Well, it's very interesting. Um, Admittedly, there were people involved with Ray Charles Enterprise, if you will, his his manager, and uh, and people kind of surrounding and protecting Ray. They weren't the nicest people you'd ever meet, <laughs> and and you know, in all honesty, I felt a certain darkness and oppression uh, from the management and from these people who were kind of in mm. power towards the musicians. They wow. were not treated well, musicians actually were not even, um, their, their hotel rooms weren't even taken care of. You had to pay for your own hotel room. You had to dress a certain way or you would be fined, um, you know. And so there was a certain amount of that going on, which, you know, I'm just this optimistic guy. You mm-hmm. know, I, I kind of see the glass as half full instead of half empty. And here I was traveling, you know, all over the world playing with Ray Charles. So, I ended up having a unique relationship with Ray Charles because Ray loved blues guitar. And I learned early on that I could get Ray Charles to squiggle in his chair and scream in delight with the right placed guitar blues note. <laughs> and it was an epiphany. It was like going to the, uh, the skeet shoot at the, uh, at the you know at the uh, amusement park and hitting the bell, ding, because <laughs> I'd play a certain note a certain way, and he would turn around and go, "Oh, you nasty boy!" <laughs> I mean, you know, for for a Jewish guitar player from Connecticut, to be, you know, to get Ray Charles to squiggle in his chair and scream in delight, it was one of the true wonders and epiphanies for me, and and affirmations for me as a musician up until that time. I, I actually do have a bunch of, uh, there's a, a couple of YouTube videos that if you type in Jeff Pevar, P-E-V-A-R, and Ray Charles, you will actually see this happening. There's, there's a song <laughs> called All I Want to Do. Mm-hmm. And, and he visibly, you know, screams and screeches with delight from, 
you know, just feeling this <laughs> vibrant, passionate blues feeling. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. so that was an absolute thrill for me. Ray, uh, because he was blind, you know, you, you just didn't have the same kind of connection you might have with a musician. You can kind of look into the eyes, into their eyes and just kind of go, Hey man, yeah, how you doing brother? So, you know, but Ray was a, a genius in every sense of the word. We would be in rehearsals with a full, you know, on, ensemble, and we'd stop, and he'd go, uh, 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 a third trumpet, uh, isn't that supposed to be a B flat and bar uh, 35? Mm. You know, the guy heard everything, and, oh. and he really knew what he was doing. Yeah. Um, part uh, at, at the end of the first tour I ended up doing with him, he says to me one day, uh, son, uh, I, I'm doing I'm doing some recording, and I'd like to have you come out to my studio. So I had heard horror stories of musicians being underpaid, you know, being in the studio, and with, with him. And I said, "Well, Mr. Charles, I, I would love to be there. I just want you to know that I, I get double scale." And he he replied, "He goes double scale." Honey, I don't pay God double scale. <laughs> he said, but you come out and I'll take care of you. And I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do? Turn him down? You know, it's Ray yeah, Charles. Yeah. I mean, so I ended up going out and playing on a Christmas record. And it's kind of interesting, this being the Christmas season. There's a record called The Spirit of Christmas. And I play on uh, Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer, you know, real blues style, <laughs> and uh, I think What Child Is This on that record. That's cool. Those are some classic so, stories. Yeah, man, it was uh, <laughs> an amazing opportunity. When I worked with Ray, we were in the studio. He was doing all the tape bopping. He was d- running the machines. He had his valet who would bring us into the studio, and, his va- and I would plug into a little multi-effects unit that he had in the studio it was an Ibanez multi effects unit that had compression and distortion and chorus. Mm-hmm. And and so my guitar would go straight into that and mm-hmm. he would record direct from that. And how it would work was he played the tune, I would blow down it, you know, just improvise, and then he would go back and listen and he goes, Oh yeah, I I love I love that. But right here, could you go Boom, 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 boom. And I go, well, yeah, go ahead. And I go, boom, 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 boom. And he go, yeah, yeah, just like that. Awesome. Okay. And then <laughs> we'd go down the tune like that. So it was like a combination of him just letting me do my thing, and then he would sing me lines he wanted to hear. Wow. That's an amazing. That's so really it was, cool. It was a profound experience to just be, you know, working with him that way. Yeah. And then, uh, and then fortunately... I, I learned a lesson about, you know, handling my business well, you know, because at the end of the end of the session, he asked me, you know, well, well, well how much do you figure I owe you? <laughs> <laughs> and I heard these stories of him, you know, not paying people well. Yeah. So I just decided to ask for twice as much as I wanted, figuring, you know, he would cut me down. And after I gave him the number, he said, uh, well, well, okay. <laughs> I was, like, really surprised. But so goes the saying, you're worth as much as you're willing to ask. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's neat. Thanks for sharing those stories. Those were fantastic stories. And, you know, those are priceless moments that, that'll live with you for the rest of your life and that's 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 such a such a cool thing you know after ray you know your career continued to really snowball i mean you wanted to play with some other really amazing musicians such as james taylor and mark Cohn, joe cocker of course crosby stills and nash carly simon kenny loggins and so many others and when okay when you think back to all of these connections can you pinpoint something specific about what these artists liked about what you brought to their music nice well you know i one of the things that I, as time has gone on, you know, I really am a fan of melody, and I'm a fan of space, and I'm a fan of dynamics, mm-hmm. and I'm a fan of, you know, I, I, one thing Crosby used to say about me was, I played the song, you know, and I thought that was a beautiful um, tribute, you know, in regards to, you know, when you're a musician, I mean... You know, as my friend Michael Ruff said years ago, you can either try to be a musician or you can be a musician. And, and you know, I, I kind of skirt a little bit, you know, on both. I mean, I'm attempting to play music as well as I can. And at the same time, you know, I would like to believe that the more we do this, it becomes an innate 
part of who we are, just like having a conversation. It's like, do you think about what words you're going to choose, or you just kind of go with the flow of what your idea is, the idea that you want to convey, and then you just find the words to do it. Fortunately, with music, it's a, it's another language, and it's something that um, is... Uh, I, I'm always um, excited at the fact that whenever you play a song, it, it will probably be entirely different from moment to moment or day to day or what happened to you that morning. Um, but to answer your question, I'd like to believe that what I try to do is um, interpret what it is is right for the song and right for the artist, and then just don't think and just do what I do. You know, my, my intention is just, just to, uh, you know, be part of the music and, 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 you know, support it and leave space for all the other elements of the music to talk, you know, together like a, like a, 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 a bouillabaisse, a soup, you know, <laughs> where all the flavors mm-hmm. affect the final outcome. Right. We all know the name Marcone pretty well, and uh, but you and Mark uh, opened up for uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash for a few shows in the early '90s. But uh, it was right around that time that David Crosby actually asked you to tour with him and Graham Nash, and it sort of sealed uh, a very special relationship that you have with David. Can you uh, fill us in on the details on that, Jeff? Sure. Well. Um Mark and I, you know, toured for about a year as a duo, which was a wonderful opportunity for me. Mark is a profoundly talented man and, and, a, and a dear man. And uh, at that time, you know, he had won uh, Best New Artist. And so things were really, you know, happening for Mark. And um, through my association with James Taylor, I got recommended to Mark. Uh, I had met James living in New York City and I met James through mutual friends, and he had recommended me to Mark. And, and so Mark and I opened for Crosby, Stills, and Nash uh, during, you know, one of their tours. We had about, oh, eight shows or so. And after, like, I think it was the second show, Crosby pulls me aside, and he says, Nash and I have been watching you, and we think you'd be the perfect addition to when we're playing duo when we're not playing with Steven. And, you know, of course, my mouth dropped to the floor. I mean, I wanted to say, well, I don't know, Dave, I got too many weddings booked back in <laughs> Connecticut. But I decided to, uh, you know, not not do that. Um, you know, I, I had been a Crosby, Stills, and Nash fan my entire life. I mean, that stuff really uh, was this beautiful melding of folk and and, and rock and and blues, if you will, you know, and uh, just the American, you know, it was just such a beautiful combination of music. So it was very much a part of my development, you know, again, me being a self-taught musician who learned how to play, figuring out these these various songs. And so, um, so we hit it off uh, right away. And for Graham and David to be able to find a musician who was, um, you know, a guitar player who was healthy and, and happy. You know, I know they had been going through some stuff, you know, with their, their, their normal band and, and, you know, look, you know, who knows the ins and outs of between Steven and David and Graham, but, you know, sometimes when you have a fresh uh, element in a musical situation, it just brings out something fresh. Yeah. So, um, I uh, ended up touring with David and Graham as a trio, and and again, as I mentioned before, there were times where they would take their set list and and tear it up, and we would play songs that I had never heard before, and um, it was just exciting for them to have, you know, a a younger, vivacious dude who could follow them and, and, and support them wherever they wanted to take the music. Yeah. I wanted to jump ahead and can kind of continue the conversation uh, specifically about David Crosby and, of course, the band that you guys put together called CPR, which was Crosby, Pivar, and and uh, Raymond. And there's obviously a real special story behind the you know your your collaboration with David Crosby and his son James Raymond. I mean, you know, the, the, it's sort of a it's very touching. It's kind of inspirational, and the music was a culmination of the reunion of of David and his son James. Uh, who he'd, he had given up for adoption, I think, 30 years prior to that. And describe, I was just curious for you to describe what you witnessed with David and James when you stepped into the band in the early going. I mean, how was the chemistry between the two of them? It was a very interesting opportunity to be a voyeur and a participant in a father and son reunion. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there obviously was 
animosity, uh, you know, in regards to David meeting James, because I'm sure he felt somewhere along the way that he had, you know, abandoned James. And yeah. James, to his credit, as the this, as this story was told to me, when, uh, you know, Crosby had, had gone through uh, some, well, he was not being very friendly to his body for years. Yeah, and it, right. it caught up with him when his liver decided it didn't want to, you know, work anymore. And so Crosby was waiting a transplant, and his liver was like down to 10% or something crazy. And right around the time that David um, was either waiting for his liver or maybe he had just gotten the transplant was when he met James. Mm -hmm. And uh, so James, you know, as I understood it, James said to David, listen, just so you know, I'm not coming from a place of anger. I've had a great family who raised me up. I just wanted to have a chance to meet you and, uh, you know, take it from there. So that really kind of cleared the air in regards to David, you know, uh, you know, to James coming from a place of resentment or whatever. And, and David contacted me and said, listen, I heard a demo of of my, my son and he's really talented. And I wanted to see what it would be like to have the three of us play together. So we booked a tour we did, you know, a couple rehearsals, not very many, and we booked about 10 dates on the west coast of, of the state, and our very first record came from that, which is Live at Cuesta College, is the double CD right. of, of, the, you know, of an entire night. And uh, we went into the studio after that, and we ended up writing together. So it was a very interesting opportunity for, uh, for us all to collaborate, you know, some songs would be the three of us writing together. Some songs were songs James and David worked on, and I would just kind of support them. There was a couple songs that I took some of David's lyrics and put them into, you know, uh, kind of blues rock type things. Uh, so it, we, we worked in every which way for this debut record. And when the debut record came out, there were reviews saying this is the best music Crosby had done in 20 years. <laughs> yeah. and, and we do have fans out there who direly miss the band. Um, I'm one of so, them. So, you know, <laughs> as, as life kind of moves along, you know, sometimes just certain uh, associations and certain projects have their shelf life. Yeah. And the music business being what it is, it you know, it's not exactly... I mean, I think the records might have gone ball side. You know, I mean, we didn't sell that many of them. <laughs> and, you know, as we know, to be able to keep a project going you know, it has to kind of be able to pay for itself. And admittedly, with David being able to tour as Crosby, Sills, and Nash, there was a little bit of a financial difference between what he would be able to earn with CPR and what he'd be able to earn yeah. with, with Crosby, Sills, and Nash. Yeah. So, you know, it just kind of took its natural course, and if it's going to happen again, I would be surprised, but I would be delighted. Yeah. So, you know, that we'll see uh, where it's all supposed to go. So you actually have a Balsa record? Yeah, well, you know, it's like it's kind of a made up. It, it, it's like if a record goes gold, gold I know, or I know. platinum, I, so I, I think I always went ball so. I got to say one of those sometime. That's cool. <laughs> hey, Jeff and Eddie, I want to take a break and uh, let's play a CPR track. And the one I want to play right now is one that uh, Jeff was pretty involved with in the writing process. And uh, this is a track from the album Just Like Gravity. This is Katie Did. Pretty good ear and legs up here and she did 
Chicago She went down to L.A. Sometimes no one listened Sometimes they did Sometimes she got to play And Sometimes she'd miss her weak fear The sky like a big blue ball Guitar would start talking to her heart The girl was meant to rock and roll Katie did, Katie did, Katie did What had to be done Katie did Katie did, Katie did, what had to be done. Katie did, Katie did, Katie did, what had to be done. There's a lot of fans out there of CPR that, you know, wish that you were still putting out new music, and I'm definitely one of them. I I honestly don't know how I found out about CPR back, I think it was 97 or 98, whenever that first record came out. But uh, I I heard about it, and I bought it right away, and it's it's been a favorite of mine for years. I I absolutely love it. It's It's a magnificent album, and it was a combination of... You know, just beautiful vocal harmonies that, you know, of course, we've come to expect from from David and, and some very uniquely arranged songs with your stellar guitar touches. And, you know, how involved were you from a songwriting perspective? I mean, was, was CPR David and James Baby or were you just as instrumental in the creation of the songs? Not at all. You weren't? Not at all. You weren't? I was totally involved uh, with everything, nuts and bolts, and I was also singing the third harmony. So those, yeah. those three parts are, you know, I'm on the bottom normally but sometimes top, you know, Uh so it was very much um, a band situation. We were all very, you know, much involved with arrangements and direction and chordal suggestions, and and there were times when actually James and I were very involved with the music and David would be involved with lyrics, But, but really every which way it was different. You know, there were, there were times where, James and I were in the studio doing background vocals, laughing because Crosby was on the couch snoring. You know, it was just, you know, there was all different types of things. The reality was there was a certain amount of trust there that David put into us. And for him to make this opportunity available to us was a real beautiful gift. And I will love him forever for uh, choosing me to uh, be involved with this uh, beautiful um reunion between him and James. Yeah. And, you know, as as time went on, their association needed to develop, and it needed to develop with without me there. Um, yeah. And, you know, I've, I've gone through different uh, head spaces about it, because there's been times when, you know, it felt, I was, I was feeling sad that it ended, but in actuality, you know, at a certain point, you know, the Things have their natural order of of of, of shelf life. Excuse yeah. me, a third of it uh, of shelf life, <laughs> and and I wouldn't be doing the things that I would be doing now had this continued longer. Now I have uh, two movie scores that I've done. I have uh, a, a, a soundtrack CD of my own and my own new debut record, and. So, in a way, you know, when the fledgling gets kind of ousted from the nest, if you will, you know, at a certain point, one door closes, another door opens. Yeah. You know, it wasn't really my decision to end uh, the tenure there, but it was just the natural order of, of, of things, and I have gotten to a really comfortable, wonderful place in it, and we're all still really good friends. I just went to visit them touring with CSN, 
and uh, CSN sounds better than ever, and partly because uh, the drummer that was in CPR, Steve DeStanislaw, is now in the band. Gotcha, gotcha. Very cool. Well, you're speaking so, about... Uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, it's just a, it's just a really good thing. I've, I've gotten to a very peaceful place. There, were, uh, there, were, uh, there was a period of time that I was mourning the loss of CPR because I felt like there was more stuff we were supposed to do together. But as I've learned in my life, Things do happen for a reason, and things end at, at the perfect timing for a reason. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right, and there's probably wisdom in that. Sometimes, uh, if it was supposed to end, it was supposed to end, uh, and but yeah. but more doors were opening up to you. And and to your point of you know you're touching film scores now, and I believe it was the summer of uh, 2011 that uh, that Scott Blum needed a score yeah. for his new film. It was called Walk In, and uh, yeah. he contacted you, and you accepted that offer to to write some some pieces of original music. So uh, you know was it, the was which one, was, which one was first? Was this your first foray into film, or was the the other one the in, before that? Well, I, this was, and, and and you know, I've done some some commercial, uh, if you will, commercial music to mm-hmm. to film, but uh-huh. not a an actual movie. Right. So this is something that not only I'd wanted to do my whole life, but I had an innate sense that I would be good at it. You know, it, I, I'm. I just have always had the feeling that I had a natural propensity to being able to um, create music for video and to support a feeling of an image, you know, which is, um, you know, another art as compared to just composing music. And so uh, when when Scott Blum asked me, or Bloom asked me uh, to do this, and he, you know, let me know what the budget was like, it, it, it was not exactly what I would hope on a financial level, but it, it, it was priceless in regards to uh, the um, not only the friendship that I struck up with him, but mm-hmm. the opportunity to learn how to, uh, you know, a, and to experience what it would be like to apply music to a movie. And, yeah. and the, mu- the movie is beautiful, and it's Scott's first you know, directing experience. So, you know, sometimes writers of books will actually hire, you know, other um, uh, experienced, seasoned screenwriters and all that stuff. But Scott felt compelled to do this himself, and he did an amazing job for his first movie, and I would like to say the same for my editions. Um, I ended up reading the script and writing about 12 tunes in, in, you know, uh, two days of just just some emotional content. You know, the, the, the script had some emotional content in regards to the hero uh, dying of cancer and a walk-in is a spirit that takes over a body. It's something I'd never heard of before, but I actually found it in Wikipedia. So it's got some spiritual, uh, uh, you know, feelings in the movie, some joyous, some, you know, it's very emotional. And, and the cinematography is just beautiful. And so I wrote about 12 pieces and sent them to Scott. And Scott made my job very, very easy. He is a very adept musical, uh, he has a, a very adept musical sense to his, um, his experience. You know, he knows music. And, and so he would, when he would send me cues, he would send me, uh, quick time files. Either they would be my songs that I'd, written, you know, and, and kind of devised for the movie, or he would pick other accomplished soundtrack uh, music makers, <laughs> a specialist, who, have, who um, he would pick songs as temp tracks mm-hmm. for particular scenes with the direction to say, look, Jeff, this is just so I could cut to the tempo of this piece. You write whatever you want to, but just understand that this piece is pretty much working for me in regards to its direction and color. That's so nice. that made it very, very much easier for me rather than starting with an, an entirely open slate because, oh my God, is it a rock and roll tune? Is it a mambo? Is it a, uh, you know, is it a new age? Is it, mm-hmm. you know, this way I had an actual direction to come from. And so it gave me a starting point, and I would utilize those pieces as kind of a, a guidepost, and then I would d- devise my own 
chords and my own uh, melodies and my own you know feeling for what I felt would be nice for the for yeah. the for, the, in, for yeah. any individual cue, and then he, he and I would get together, and then we would kind of hone them together. So it was a lovely experience, and out of the movie, which is now I think you know showing around here and there in independent uh, venues, uh, we have a independent soundtrack called Walk In, and of the 17 pieces, 14 of them I play all the instruments on, and uh, I think three are other artists that were, they, you know, brought in a cue for the for the movie. Yep. Hey, um, uh, we're running a little short on time, but what we need to get to, uh, I want to talk about your uh, debut album project. Wonderful. Which I'm sure led a lot of fans of yours that have been waiting for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. So let's let's start from the beginning when your friend Greg Frederick came to you to compose music for a new documentary on the Oregon Caves and just kind of take it from yep. there. So I get a phone call from my friend Greg Frederick, Frederick who's a uh, producer and also a bassist, and we sometimes play uh, together in his band, uh, The Rogue Suspects, or in his band Left. And Greg called me and he says, hey, I've got this uh, production I'm going to do for SOP TV, PBS, um, on the Oregon Caves. Would you be interested in composing some guitar music for it? I said, sure, I'd love to. And about a week or a few days after I agreed to it, he said, hey, I just I have some exciting news. You know, if you want to, you can, we can bring a little, you know, mobile recording system into the caves themselves, and you can record your guitar in the caves themselves. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and and it was interesting because right from the get go, a voice said to me, or I felt this comforting feeling that I was to not prepare anything in advance. I was supposed to go their day of recording and just improvise because you know, knowing that this place, I mean, it's a it's a cave and it's a connection to the center of the earth or whatever. You know, it's this hallowed national park and. Mm-hmm that I had a feeling that the caves would kind of give me some juice. You know, I'd, I'd be feeling something that I wouldn't feel sitting in my bedroom or in my studio kind of imagining what I would play there. And also I had the innate feeling that, well, oftentimes the music is slightly superfluous to the actual story. It's support music. It's bumper music. So, you know, the the uh, it fades from black into the film, and then you hear some nice guitar music, and then some guy goes, and Oregon Caves were discovered in 1845, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, it wasn't like I had to write Tchaikovsky or, or something very profound. I could just kind of go in and jam, and some nice music would come from it. I, I'm very comfortable with the fact that if somebody hands me a guitar, I could play some pretty music, you know? Yeah. So I went in with that idea. And uh, the day of recording, I, brought, I decided to bring in two instruments, a six-string acoustic and a eight-string mando cello, which is like a mandolin, but mm-hmm. larger-bodied like a cello. And, um, and I did one take on 12 different pieces, one after the other, not having any idea how I would start, where it would go, how it would end. It was just one of these kind of, all right, well, let's, how about this? And I did different tunings on guitar. I brought a capo. I didn't even bring a tuner. I most certainly didn't bring a, a metronome. I was just kind of playing it off, off the cuff. And um, one of the pieces of direction I was given was when we kind of do this sound, which can uh, be helpful for um, getting video and audio put together, they would do a hand clap. Greg said, Let's, why don't you wait like five or ten seconds? And just let's record some of the sound of the cave. So inside the cave, which was probably about 45, 50 degrees, probably 45 degrees or somewhere thereabouts, it was chilly. Yeah. You could hear the condensation. You can hear the dripping. It was a, a yeah. very palpable environment. And it was a great way to start each tune for me because it gave me this, oh, platform to enter and, and to jump off of uh, to create music. Mm-hmm. Um, there is one song, there was only one song that I was given any direction at all, and that direction is the opener of the record. And um, 
Greg's uh, the the other the uh, woman Debbie, I think her name is, uh, gave me a direction. She said, "You know, did you know that the caves were formed by the shifting of tectonic plates?" Mm -hmm. I said, "Oh, really?" And she goes, "Why don't you write a song about that?" <laughs> <laughs> so the first song on the record is called "Plates," right? And right. I kind of you know hit hit the guitar a little bit and kind of took the pick down the strings and you know so. Anyway, long story short, I had these 12 pieces that I wrote in the caves, and like we had planned, the assignment was they would utilize any of those pieces for this documentary, which they did. And the guitar is supportive, as I initially had understood it would be. And then we get a phone call. Uh, Greg calls me and says, well, the National Parks people really love this music, and they wanted to know if you'd be interested in putting this out as a CD so they can sell it in the National Parks. And I said, well, yeah, I like that, but <laughs> I think I'm going to take this stuff back to my studio and mess around with it a little bit. And so I took the tracks back, and I listened to them, and I did a little bit of editing here and there. And then I decided, hmm, you know, I want to add some percussion, and mm, I want to add some fretless bass, and ooh, maybe mandolin on this one, and ooh, maybe banjo on that one, even though I barely play banjo. And I have a dear friend named Don Emery who made me this amazing acoustic fretless guitar, and I ended up using that, and it turned out to be the perfect instrument for me to use to play solos. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as this course went along, and I'm kind of filling out this music a little bit more, for lack of other terms, symphonically, you know, adding other elements just to kind of bring out elements that I was maybe hearing while I was playing, but it was, you know, I wanted it to be more than a solo guitar record. Um, and so... As time went on, I decided to call in some special guests. And there's uh, Crystal Reeves, who plays violin and viola, who lives in Ashland. And there's Matthew Schoening, who plays cello, and he lives in um, Mount Shasta. And Mikey Stevens, who uh, is a friend of mine and plays with State of Jefferson. And called on a few other special guests. Um, this guy, um, uh, Craig Eason, who plays violin with Hans Zimmer. I know him from back east. And a friend of mine, Bill Holloman, who played clarinet. And then, on a whim, on a Sunday, about 10 in the morning, I decide to send a song to John Anderson from Yes. <laughs> now, Jeez. John is, I mean, I've, I've always loved Yes. Oh, yes, to me, me is an iconic, amazing, one-of-a-kind anomaly. Absolutely. Uh, they, there has never been anything like it, and never will be anything like it. That's right. right. You know, and John is a completely unique musician and, and vocalist. And I happened to meet him at a Ricky Lee Jones gig. He happened to be in the audience, and we met backstage, and he said he, he liked the way I played, and he gave me his card. He said, I'd love to collaborate. And I was like, oh, yeah, sure you do. <laughs> and so on Sunday morning, I decided to send John one of these tunes with the story. And I, and I also sent him two other tunes, just so we could kind of get a background, but there was this one song that I thought, this really needs something, and it would be really cool. So I sent it to him at 10 in the morning, at 1 in the afternoon, three hours later, all three songs come back with lyrics and harmonies wow. and overdubs. Wow, you and kidding. I flip out. I mean, <laughs> I am just beside myself. My goosebumps have goosebumps. You know, so I realize all of a sudden... This has been endorsed by one of my favorite musicians, yeah. and you know, and he's so perfect because he would often write these lyrics that were so cosmic and so earth, you know, friendly. And anyway, long story short, this is becoming my first record. I, I had yeah. no idea that when I went into the caves, I was actually writing my first record. Mm -hmm. And I've always wanted to do a record, but I it always eluded me. I it was daunting to me. It's like well, how do I encapsulate who the hell I think I am in a record? I, I play so many different styles of music. I would want to try to represent them all, and then if I did that, it would be the most schizophrenic record ever. <laughs> so, it, unbeknownst to me, in one fell swoop in three hours visiting the caves, I wrote my first record and then just honed the overdubs and brought in some special guests, and I have a record that is on its way to my doorstep called From the Core. Yes. And you were kind enough to send Eddie and me a few tracks, and we listened to it, and uh, we both we both really enjoyed. Uh, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. Absolutely, they're <clears throat> they're very earthy, you know, very organic, and of course, 
you know, I can see how you were inspired by being in, in, in those caverns or those caves uh, and being in nature like that. It, it Really, I think, you know, it. I think being in that setting really aided in, in how you uh, came up with, like you said, you just went in there with really no concept of what you were going to play, but it certainly you sort of took the nature out of, of, out of the atmosphere and, and put that into your music. Awesome. I appreciate that. Well, you know, there's something to be said about setting an intention. And I have sent, set an intention for many years that I, I want to be my own recording artist. And it's been, like I said, daunting to me, how, how do I accomplish this? And I've certainly done it, you know, with CPR records and being co-writers with that and, and writing with some other artists and getting some stuff out there. But, you know, to kind of grab the reins, grab the cow by the horns of like, what do I want to do? for my first record, which would seemingly be so important to set the bar. And the thing that's so beautiful about this for me is I've heard a lot of other guitar players put out guitar player records, and there's the obligatory blues tune that lasts forever and a million solos, and this is how fast I can play. And, you know, those types of records are fusion records where it's like, you know, you really need to be someone who wants to hear chops and licks to really get into the, to it. But this is a music record. It's a, it's a, it's a conceptual record. And, yeah. and I love that I have the alibi. If somebody doesn't like it, well, hey, I wrote it in three <laughs> hours. I mean, come on. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, hey, guys, let's take a short break, and I want to check out a track from Jeff's debut solo album, From the Core, and this is a track called Plates. When you recorded in the caves, uh, did you engineer this yourself? Did you set up your own mics? Did you, or did no. someone someone else assist you with that? 
No, there's a man named Brett Levick, and Brett is a wonderful singer, singer songwriter, and yeah. engineer, and someone that I've actually uh, been involved with in, in a production company. We have uh, uh, a production company called Three Headed Monster, and we've put out some library music together. So Brett is one of these guys who's just ridiculously talented as a singer songwriter, and he plays in Ashland, Oregon, uh, with his band Left, and uh, he uh, writes songs for TV, television, and this and that. But he was hired by Greg to be the engineer that day. So all okay. I had to do was shiver and uh, play my guitar. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, though, just from an engineering standpoint, it I, I can imagine it was probably a fairly simple setup. I mean, you probably just you mic'd your guitar and, and then, but did you mic the space also? Did you, did you put uh, a single or two stereo pairs of mics around the room to capture the ambience in the room? So, so here's, here's what Brett did. And, and I mixed the record here at my, at my studio. So I, uh-huh. it was nice having the choice of various things in regards to what was recorded in the caves. He had a, a close mic, Yep. which was the meat of the sound that I used and what I featured in the recording session. Uh, or, But there were times where I would also bring in the other microphones. And so he had one close mic, one stereo um, mic that was, I would guess, off-axis and maybe, uh, I don't remember the exact positioning, although there are pictures of, of this. And in fact, the entire three hours was filmed for ca- for HD cameras. So I have the entire thing, wow. uh, you know, documented. In fact, it's being dumped off uh, on a hard drive f- for my access, which I'm very excited about because I plan to utilize some of that technology to uh, put some videos together for this, yeah. in support of this. And, and then... I bought a GoPro camera. I have an idea of like putting the GoPro on the end of my banjo, and so when the banjo comes in, all of a sudden you see my fingers playing the banjo part, and then yeah. go back to the the caves. But anyway, to answer your question, Brett set up three microphones, two mono microphones, one stereo microphone, and the stereo microphone and the other mono microphone was not close mic'd, and the one was close mic'd, and that was the one that was featured the most because. Uh, I found that if I featured the room mics too much, it would be cavernous and hollow, and yeah. um, it just wouldn't be as right. rich a sound. Mm-hmm. But there are times when, at the beginning of certain songs or the ending of certain songs, where I do allow the dripping of the uh, of mm-hmm. the condensation to be part of the audio, and in fact, there were times when I had no choice anyway, you know, so there's condensation dripping, <laughs> and a friend of mine said, that's either the caves or the latrine at the at Boston <laughs> Red Sox game, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it, it does add a feeling of ambience, and it actually, there's a song on the CD called Blessing, which originally was going to be the first selection, and the Blessing starts off with about 10 seconds of just the case. So you can hear this, this space, yeah, you know, this, very this cool. you, you get a feeling of being in the space, in the cave. Yeah. And I found it to be too, um, just not strong enough an intro to the CD, because as we know, we need to grab their attention right from the get go. <laughs> yeah. My friend, uh, Jim Chapelain, who mastered the CD, who's, who's a master musician and, and mastering engineer said to me, Jeff, it's a different ball game now. It used to be where you used to spend a lot of time on the order of the songs, but nowadays people are downloading songs, so you want to put your four strongest songs up front. So I said, all right, yeah, that makes sense, fine. <laughs> so I took the uh, the song The Blessing, which has a long intro, yeah. and I used that as kind of an epilogue. It's the last tune on the record. Hey, guys, uh, let's take a listen to one more track from Jeff's new solo album, From the Core, and this is a track called Back to the Stone.
So tell us, uh, you said you, you're kind of wait, awaiting the uh, shipment to uh, arrive, and I was just curious when the album will be available for our listeners to be able to purchase, and where will it be available? Well, I have a brand new website that's going to be implemented at www.pvar.com. There's yep. one there now, but there's a brand new one that's going to have, you're going to be able to go onto this cool little, you know, you'll see from the core and you, you tag on it, and then all the ordering info, whether you want to play, pay PayPal or check or whatever. So yep. my website is going to be the main place to go to to buy the CD, but of course, uh, I will have it on iTunes. I will have it on CD Baby, on Amazon. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there may be some homeless guys, you know, on, on the streets of uh, Ashland, you know, kind of trying to sell. <laughs> sell. <laughs> hey, marketing hey, is marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so the, the the music's also going to be p- featured on that PBS documentary, right? The it's that called is correct. It's and called the music the, that is featured on the documentary is the unadorned solo acoustic tracks. And actually, at some point, depending on the popularity of this of this uh, CD, which um, there aren't any tracks that are unadorned. Uh, there's a couple that are fairly adorned. There's about two or three tracks where it's guitar and maybe one other instrument. Um, but uh, at some point, I might, you know, remix the actual solo acoustic tracks from the caves and and, and offer that out. But um, yeah, the, you know, it'll it'll be available at these various um, you know places, and um, and I'll be probably doing some at some point do a CD release party uh, when I can figure out who the heck is going to play all my parts. Okay. <laughs> well, that also. Yeah, I overdub a lot of a lot of parts, you know, on this record. I play bass and I play, you know, a tabla and I play goombeck and I play, you know, and it's not like it has to be exactly that way. And I do sometimes do gigs with a looper, so I may bring in some tracks that, you know, I, I'm still in the midst of just getting this thing uh, out to the world, and and I'm being my own press uh, manager right now, so I'm kind of yeah. wearing that hat. I, I I've worn a lot of hats from. Playing the thing to editing the thing to engineer, uh, you know, to to deciding who's going to play on it and then mixing it, and so you know, I like kind of having this one-stop shop mentality until at some point, you know, I'll, I'll let somebody else work harder at it than I am. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jeff, this has been a great chat, and uh, I'm, you know, from the tracks that Eddie and I've heard from uh, your album from the core, it sounds like it's going to be. A wonderful project, and of yeah. course, uh, you know, I'm I'm really anxious to hear that one with John Anderson too. That's going to be a real treat, yeah. no doubt. But uh, thanks, thanks for joining us, and we appreciate all the time and all the stories and getting to know you better. And of course, for more information on Jeff, you can uh, go to pvar.com. That's p-e-v-a-r.com. Awesome, it's my pleasure to talk to you guys, and I want to thank you for assisting um, independent musicians such as myself to get the word out to the world. You know, uh, this is. Uh, more than a hobby for us. This is yeah. uh, our life's path, and this is our life's passion. So to have people like you who not only do the research, you know, I'm very impressed with how you've conducted this interview, and I appreciate you knowing so much, you know, about these accomplishments of mine as you have. I'm very flattered and honored, you know, to be of service to the community as a musician, and I would like to believe being involved in the healing arts. So uh, anytime I could be of service, I'm, you know, a phone call away. Absolutely. Well, we'll catch up maybe. Uh, let's catch up again sometime and, and see how things are going. All right, my friends. Thank you so much for your time. All All right, thanks, take Jeff. care. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Special thanks to Jeff Pivar for joining us on this episode of Inside Music Cast. We'd also like to thank our correspondents, Kim Riley, Brian Pearson, Scott Gross, Max Zape, Mikhail Ingstrom, Uwe Reith, and Scott Sheriff for their continued support and content development for Inside Music Cast. Inside Music Cast is powered by Cabello Associates and Earshot Audio Post. For information about becoming a sponsor and sharing your message with thousands of music fans around the world, please visit InsideMusicCast.com for contact information. For Eddie Cabello, I'm Rick Such. Thanks for listening to Inside Music Cast. <laughs>